As I think if I told you, next week we're going to have another tutorial. So unlike every two weeks, it's going to be every week. Um, and next week will be our final tutorial, and then the week after that is the final week of the class. And that will be devoted four hours to a lecture from which you will handle the Dirac, in, uh, Dirac theory or Dirac equation, which is kind of the highlight of the course. Um, the homework I have given you today is therefore for next week, so you have one week to solve it. Uh, we decided to reduce its length by about half um, compared to last year, so you have half the time, half the exercises, so there's no excuse. Um, what I want to stress about this homework is question number one. Question number one is probably the most important homework assignment that you're getting throughout the year. Um, it's a mathematical um, exercise, no physics, but it is very important, it's absolutely crucial for everything that you're going to do next week in field integration. So without knowing that piece of mathematics, it'll be impossible to do field integration. It's not very difficult, and I also refer to the book where you can look up the solution and work through with the book. It is important you understand that very well, otherwise you'll be kind of lost. Okay, so make sure to at least do that for next week, even if, well, there's no excuse to do, not to do everything, but that's the most important thing. Okay, um, for today, we're going to deal with a simple uh, quantum, um, sort of fan path integral, which is actually a single particle um, treatment. So this could have been taught, and I think also was taught in, in undergraduate quantum mechanics. Uh, but I want to make sure to understand this for two reasons. First of all, um, the Feynman path integral is much more intuitive than a Schrodinger equation or Heisenberg equation. So even in single particle uh, quantum mechanics, it is very good to think in terms of the, of the path integral. Computationally, as you will see today, uh, the path integral is much more difficult than the Schrodinger equation, and that's why you were taught the Schrodinger equation. If you actually want to solve something, it is easier to use Schrodinger and Heisenberg. Um, but this is much more intuitive, so it's good to know it. It turns out, though, that for fields, this procedure using integral uh, is actually a uh, very neat trick to simplify your Hamiltonian, uh, and that's going to be next week. So we're going to have an hour and a half of undergraduate simple physics. Mathematics will be complicated. The physics are, uh, is quite straightforward. So let me uh, invest a little bit first to give you some intuition uh, of what the pattern goes about, and then we'll solve two examples. We will uh, compute the propagator for the free particle and for the harmonic oscillator. So as an introduction, I want to consider the double slit experiment. This is going to be the z-axis going to the right. This is the plane which I call Zi, it's the initial plane, and this is here Z final. The particles are shot at the slits from this initial point, and I am measuring them at the final point, so I'm going to call this state I, and this state final. And then it can go through either the upper or the lower um, slit. And there is a probability to go through either one. So if this is slit A, so if the particle is here, I call this state A. And if the particle is here, I call this state B. So the probability of going through the, from the initial state to this upper uh, slit, that is going to be, the, that is the probability 
which is given by the overlap between the two states. Um, let me write this the other way around. Usually read this from right to left. So it's going from initial to A. This is not the probability, this is the amplitude. The absolute value squared is the probability of this to happen. This is the uh, amplitude of this to happen. And the same thing for the lower trajectory, it's the overlap between state I and state B. The same thing can be done for going from A to F. So I'm we're going to read from the, from the right. So I'm going from A to the final state. And the same thing in the bottom. Now, what am I actually measuring? I'm actually going to measure what is the probability of going out of here and reaching this final place. And you already know from your first course in quantum mechanics that there, there can be interference and the probability could be 1, could be 0, could be anything in between. Uh, and let's see how the interference in, in this way of thinking appears. So the amplitude of going from the initial state to the final state is just the sum. It's either taking this trajectory or taking the lower trajectory. So I need to add the two amplitudes of both trajectories. So either I'm going um, I'm going to read it from the right to the left. This is the upper trajectory from I to A and then from A to F. Or I can do the same thing by going through B. From I to B and then from B to F. There's no interference yet. Okay, this was simple. There's nothing quantum about this, right? It's just simply adding other two possibilities. When does interference appear? Interference appears because this thing is not the probability. This is the amplitude. The probability of going from I to F is the absolute value squared. And then you get four terms. Two of them are classical and two of them are quantum. These are the two classical terms, the first one squared and the second term squared, and then there are cross terms, and they give rise to interference. So there's a term which is complex conjugate of F to A, and then, sorry, A, A, I, complex conjugate times second term, and then there's the opposite, which is the first one as it is, and the complex conjugate of the second term. And this second line are the interference terms. That's the, the big difference between classical and quantum physics. In classical physics, these terms wouldn't appear because what you add is probabilities. In classical physics, the probability of going from I to F is the probability of going through the top plus the probability of going through the bottom. In quantum mechanics, you have to add the amplitudes and then take the absolute value squared. That's the only difference between quantum and, and classical physics. Seems really simple, right? That's, a, that's the only difference. Uh, note one more thing. Um, you could factor out on this, in this amplitude summation, you could factor out state F to the bra of F to the beginning and the ket of I to the end. And then what you're left with in the middle is this expression. And what is this expression? So this is actually just the identity operator, the identity matrix, because it is a full set of states on this uh, plane with the slits. I'll call this ZS, by the way. So it's a full set of um, states on, on this slit, on this, uh, on this plane, so it's the identity operator. So what this is, is, is just inserting the identity between F and I. 
which is obviously the same thing. Uh, so it's important to note that, and we're going to take advantage of this in a second. Let's make this a little more, uh, let's try and take this a step further. So instead of making a double slit experiment, let's make this a many slit experiment. So I'm now going to go from zi through zs to z final. As before here, this is the z-axis. I'm going through from i to f. And now I'm going to make not just two holes in the slit, but I'm going to make many, many holes. And imagine this to be infinitely long, and there are infinite number of holes. And I'm going to give the numbers. So instead of calling them a and b, I'm going to call this hole number 0, this one hole plus 1, plus 2, and here minus 1, minus 2, and so on and so forth. So now what is the probability, or let's start with the amplitude. What is the amplitude from going from state i to state f? So now I have to sum over all of the possibilities. Either I go through n equals 0, or I go through n equals 1, or n equals minus 1, and so on. And I have to sum over all of these terms. So there are an infinite number of terms. And if you just write it like this, that's just what the sum means. And notice again that I've used here the identity, the sum over all n of the k times the y, that's the identity operator. So all I've done is inserted the identity into, um, into this uh, overlap integral. That's mathematically what I've done. Physical meaning is these slits. OK, let's go another step further. Let's add a second plane. So let's call this plane number 2. And then I'm going to add another plane, which is plane number 1. And also here I'm putting in a bunch of slits, which I also call 0, uh, minus 1, and this one is plus 1, and so on. So there are two planes. In both planes I have to go through, so I have to go through the first slit, say through uh, plus 2, and then from here I can go, say, to uh, Minus one, and then from here I can go to final. This is one possible trajectory. Right, and now I have to sum over all slits in Z1, and I have to sum over all slits in Z2, because I can go from any of the slits in Z1 to any of the slits in Z2. Right, so now what is the. So now what is the overlap integral? the overlap of, of the initial and the final function, final state, sorry, it's the sum over n1, the sum over n2, and now we have to go from the right to the left, right? So we start in the initial state, then we go to slit n1, which is summed over, and then from n1 we go to slit n2, Overlap space here. Then from slit N2, I have to go to the final state. Again, I'm now, I'm now I've done this thing with the identity matrix. I've done it twice. Once it's the sum over N1 times the two N1s, it's identity. And I've instituted the identity a second time. Sum over n2 with the two n2s. Now we're going to have many, many, many more slits. A total of capital N slits. And then it's just the integral from f to i, the sum over n1, n2, and so on until the capital N slit.
and take this entire sum. And now that we have this grid of, of it's like a lattice kind of where you jump from like a 2D lattice, you jump different lattice sites, there's a constraint that you always have to move one to the right. So you cannot stay in the same state and you cannot move back. You always have to move forward. But you can always jump. There's no uh, constraint. So you can always go from, say, plus infinity on, on this slit and then go to minus infinity on this thing. That's OK. You're allowed to do that. But you always have to move forward. Um, so now you can th kind of think of taking the continuum limit, kind of the free particle moving from the initial to the final state. And you can think of the continuum limit when this capital N goes to infinity and when the distance between the slits here goes to zero. So that's how we can think of the real world, or a one-dimensional real world, um, when you're moving in this direction, but you can or two-dimensional, uh, and, you're, and you're moving uh, up and down through this space. Um, that's the idea uh, of, of the path integral. And what we're going to do now is I'm going to first of all write down the important formula that you'll need for path integration. And the idea is that we're going to use the same idea, but now in one space dimension, only x. And instead of z, instead of propagating in space, we're going to have time. So we're going to propagate in time, but in each, at each moment in time, uh, the particle can be at uh, a different uh, place on the x-axis. So what are the important formula? So the goal of the path integral is to compute what's called the propagator. <laughs> the propagator has well, for all, technically only three arguments. Capital T is just the time difference. T final minus T initial. And this is exactly what we did in this very many slit experiment. Um, the difference is instead of Z, we now have T. So we're going from X initial, which in this case is the zero position, from the initial plane, which is at time initial, that's why I said you always have to move to the right, because in time you cannot move back. So you're always moving to the right. Um, and the overlap with the x final, which was this final state, at the final time. And this overlap is given by the amplitude, a certain amplitude, and this amplitude is what we call the propagator. The absolute value squared of the propagator is the probability of doing this. How do you compute it? So you. Um, derive this in class, and today we're going to apply this formula. Uh, and capital T is the time it took to do this process. And obviously, the amplitude depends on the time. Right? If, if you think, what is the probability, even in classical physics, of going from point A to point B in one second, it's different than what we're doing in two seconds. So it obviously depends on the time and on the position of these two places. The path integral is where you use all of these fancy symbols. And let me break it down to you. So this n is a normalization constant, which is equal to the mass of the particle divided by 2 pi i h bar delta t to the power n over 2. n is the number of slits, or the number of time slices that you use in your, sorry, number of planes, number of slices that you have in time. And delta t is the difference between the two time slices. So what this means is that t, capital T, is divided into capital N slices, such that, and each of length delta t, such that n times delta t is equal to the time it takes. 
And as we already said, the continuum limit is when delta t goes to zero and capital N goes to infinity, right? such that the total time remains constant. What does this integral, this fancy integral mean? Sometimes called a functional integral, um, but it's not very functional. And actually, to actually use it, you have to break it down into its discrete um, The screen notation, so you're integrating over dxn, um, and it's a multiplication, so it's technically an integral over dx n minus 1, dx n minus 2, and so on, dx2, dx1. What does this mean? On every plane, and I'm taking the continuum one, that's why it's an integral over x, I have to integrate over all of the slits. Second plane, integrate over the entire, uh, um, all the slits on, in the plane. So this integrals, these integrals are exactly the same as the sums that appear up here. And one more thing we're missing. We're missing what is S. S is the action, which appears here in the exponent. And it's just the classical, or classical, but in the action of the particle, which goes from initial to final time, integral dt, and then times the Lagrangian. We're going to do only 1D problems in this, uh, this course. So it's kinetic energy minus potential energy. And you have, in order to actually calculate the um, the action, you need boundary conditions, so you need to know the value um, xi at ti and the value xf at tf. So you need to know where the particle started and where the particle ended and at which time that happened. And then you can evaluate this integral, plug in uh, the, the boundary conditions, and you can actually find a number with the correct units, of course, for the, um, uh, for the action. So uh, if you want to plot what this exactly means, it's actually, as I was already pointing out, very similar to um, the, this many-slit experiment. You start off at some initial point, at some initial time, and you arrive at some final point, at some final time. So this is where you shoot at a particle, you let it go, be on your own, and this is where your detector is. Then you ask the question, as given the time, capital T, what is the probability that the particle that I released here actually got to this detector? And in order to compute it, what you have to do is kind of split up time. So this thing here will be T final. But then you split up time into many, many intervals, and so on. This thing will be, so here is t final minus delta t. Here will be, let's call it, yeah, OK, minus delta t. Let's call this t1, t2, and somewhere in the middle, there's a Tn and a Tn plus 1. The difference between these two times is delta t. Uh, we also identify t final with t capital N. So this could be, this would just be t capital N minus 1. And the initial time, so this is 1, not initial. This thing is t initial, and we call this t0. And now the, the particle can take any trajectory in time. So at time, it must start off here. That's where it started. But as it advances, it can now move around. So for example, it could first go to the right. And then it can go stay at the same place. And then it can go to the right again. It can go to the left. Actually, this is many dots. Somehow get here. And then it could go to the left again. 
and in the end you'll reach here. This is one option. A second option, you could first go to the left and then to the right and so on. But there are many different trajectories. There are an infinite, an infinitely possible amount of uh, trajectories. But as you see, this is exactly the same idea as in this method experiment. The only difference is now exchange time for z. So the particle is actually just moving back and forth on the x-axis. Right? There's always the same axis. It's actually uh, advancing in a certain direction. It's moving back and forth on the x-axis. Um, and the idea is that each of these trajectories now contributes to the propagator with a certain, so the integral is just a sum. You're summing over all the trajectories. X is x of t. x of t describes a certain path. You're summing over all options x of t, so over all possible paths. And the weight of each path is uh, a certain phase factor. So the probability, this is a very important uh, thing to understand, the probability of each trajectory is one. Each simple trajectory, so for, eject, for some trajectory x of t, the probability is the absolute value of this coefficient, which is one, because it's e to the i. So each trajectory has the same probability, the same amplitude. But as you sum over all trajectories, they all have a different phase, and this phase difference causes constructive or destructive interference. And it's, interesting, it's very interesting to, to understand what happens in the classical limit. In the classical limit, you want to take h bar to 0. So what happens to this factor when h bar goes to 0? It starts oscillating really, really quickly, right? For any s. It also is really, really quickly because 1 over h bar is kind of the frequency of the oscillation. But what happens when you're summing over many, many terms where all are oscillating really, really quickly and you kind of average over all frequencies, you average over all contributions? The only contribution that is left is the one that oscillates the slowest. And the one that oscillates the slowest is the one where s is minimal. That's the least action principle. So that's how this relates to uh, classical physics. I'm actually going to show this mathematical. It's, I've, I kind of did it by hand waving, but you can actually do this mathematically as well. It's called the stationary phase approximation. If anyone has learned that in some other course. OK, questions so far? So we have intuition. We have formula. Now let's do math. So the first propagator that we want to um, we want to compute, we want to derive, is the free particle propagator. So there's a particle of mass m and no potential v equals 0. This means that the action is just the integral dt over 1 half mx dot squared. And that means that the propagator In about a minute, I'll stop writing this argument every single time. But you're going to realize it's there. Uh, e to the i over h bar integral from 0 to capital T. So instead of integrating from t initial to t final, where am I? I can just, because it doesn't depend on the absolute time, I might as well shift it from 0 to capital T which is what I'm doing here, there's an i. And then there's the action Lagrangian squared. There we go. How are we going to compute this? Well, simple. We have to make it discrete. We don't know how to integrate this complex thing. We're integrating over trajectories, but we only have the derivative of the trajectory in the um, up here. And there's a second integral up here as well. So how exactly are we supposed to do this? We have to discretize. That's kind of what this drawing is also hinting at you. So now to discretize, we're not going to, I'm going to plug in the, no, this sim, kind of simple notation. So we're going to plug in the complicated way of writing it. And we're going to plug in um, a discrete derivative. So x dot is equal to xn plus 1 minus xn divided by delta t. And we're going to plug in. We have to turn this integral into a sum. So integral dt 
is going to become um, a sum over n. And then the dt, we have to make sure that our units are still the same, so we have to put in delta t. So we're discretizing time, not space. Space remains continuous. We're, discre we're discretizing time. And now the propagator is equal to the normalization constant. Remember also the, the, the renormalization constant has delta t in it, so that's OK. We're going to hopefully be able to cancel them in the end. Obviously, the, the final solution cannot depend uh, on delta t or on capital N. Otherwise, we have a problem, right? Because it's our choice how big we make this, uh, this discretization. So this is uh, normalization times the integral over all of these the x's, and then there's an e to the i m over 2 h bar delta t, sum from n equals 0 to n minus 1, x n plus 1 minus x n squared. It looks complicated, but let me show that this is actually not very complicated. Sometimes it's helpful to just write out the entire sum. Same thing. But this looks really complicated, and this, I mean, it doesn't look fun, but at least you understand what's going on, right? So, what do we have to do? We have to compute these integrals. Let's start by integrating the integral over dx1. And then, we're into, and then we'll do the integral over x2, and then over x3, and so on. And at some point, hopefully, we'll recognize some pattern, and then we'll be able to, to do the nth integral, and then also kind of understand what the capital nth integral should look like. Okay, so it's about pattern recognition. So let's start. Integral over x1. So I'm going to call this i1, and I'm only going to copy the parts now that depend on x1. Everything else I'm going to leave for later. So it's integral over dx1, and then e to the i m 2h bar delta t. x1 appears here and here, and in the next term, you're going to have x3 and x2, right? So it's only the first two terms in here. So let's uh, open up the brackets up here, and you might recognize something really nicely. So if you open this up, you get uh, x1 squared minus 2x1 x0 plus x0 squared plus x2 squared um, minus 2x2 x1 plus x1 squared. And remember, out of all of these x's, we only care about x1. Everything else is like a parameter. It's a constant as far as we're concerned. So we're only integrating over x1. Where does x1 appear? There's an x1 squared here. There's an x1 here. Another one here. And an x1 squared here. So what is this? The Gaussian integral. Right, it's e to the power something x squared. And then there's also a linear term. But we know how to do Gaussian integration. We have to complete the square, which I'll do for you. And then we'll be able to integrate uh, the simple Gaussian integral. So it's integral over dx1, e to the im over 2h bar delta t. 
I'm now completing the square. That is beautiful. We can now call this stuff here some new variable u. And it is now the, 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 the x1, which I'm integrating over, appears only here now. This is just a constant phase. This goes outside the integral. I don't care about it. And I'm left with a shifted in, uh, Gaussian. right? Um, but I can just call this entire thing u. Uh, and then integrate over u, and there's not even a Jacobian. So it's, it's really simple. You can then integrate uh, over u, and you get um, so square root pi divided by whatever is before u. And so this integral evaluates to uh, square root 1 half, 2 pi i h bar. Delta T. Divided by M. And then there's this part here. So it's I M two H bar delta T. Sorry. Two delta T times X two minus X zero squared. Divided by two. Sorry, I already used my two. That's it. Let me see, two pi i h bar delta t over m. Yeah. Guess this was like first year math. I hope this was, I jumped like one step of algebra. But I trust that you know how to do that. Uh, okay, so we've done the integral over x1. Now, notice that after we finished integral over x1, x1 obviously no longer appears uh, in, in the total integral. And notice that instead we now have this factor of x2 minus x0, and that is now divided by 2 delta t. So originally we had x1 minus x0 divided by delta t. We now have x2 minus x0 divided by 2 delta t. Of course, this makes sense. We've gotten rid of one of these planes. We've now gotten rid of this first t1 plane. But that means that in order to get from the first plane to the next plane, the time is 2 delta t. And that's why we've accumulated another delta t in the denominator. OK, very good. Integral number 2. Let's do the integral over x2. So let's see, this was instead of, we've now gotten rid of the, the x1 here, and we've gotten rid of this part, and we have to replace all of that stuff with what we've evaluated here, and I'm now going to take all the parts that um, depend on x2. So from i2, we have the integral over dx2, e to the i m over 2 h bar delta t. So I've taken the x2 that appeared here. For the moment, I'm just going to remember that I have this constant, but I'm not going to include it. I'm going to write it a million times. But I have to remember to, in the end, 
multiply this normalization constant by what I received here. Right? But all I'm using at the moment is this exponent, because x2 appears in it. And then here, term number 3, which I didn't write here, but it's x3 minus x2. That's this term here. This again, you can convince us by multiplying out, completing the square, it's a Gaussian integral. The only difference is we now have this 1 half here, and here we don't have it. Here, there was no 1 half. That's the only difference. So if you can do this, you can do this, right? Not saying it's pleasant, but it, it can be solved. Uh, let me complete the square for you, so you have this when you go over it again at home. So uh, in the same manner as before, after completing the square, x2 appears only here. It's now a shifted Gaussian. But x0 and x3, as far as I'm concerned at the moment, are just constants, because I'm not integrating over them. So it's just a shift. This thing is a constant phase factor, goes outside. right? And now I can replace all of this by u uh, and do the integration again. And after you do the integration, by the way, note that there's now a 3 here, 1 over 3 for x3 minus x0. It's going to translate into a 3 delta t. Uh, or it's going to translate into a, yeah, into a 3 delta t because you're moving 3. Um, 1, 2, 3. Um, mm, uh, in time, 3 uh, slices. So this evaluates to the following. It's the square root of 2 over 3. 2 pi i h bar delta t over m into the i m over 2 h bar 3 delta t, as advertised already, and then x3 minus x0 squared. So let's uh, write down the intermediate step. Where did we get to? Let's take everything together. So k is now equal to the normalization constant. Then we have these uh, square roots, these uh, things that we have to take down. So there's a square root 1 half, then the square root 2 thirds, and then there's this square root 2 pi i h bar delta t over m. This thing we have twice already, so that's squared. Then we have the remaining integrals which is dx3 and so on. And now this is multiplied by e to the i um, what we have left now is in the exponent we have here. So I'm, I've taken everything outside except for the 3. So there's 1 third x3 minus x0 squared. And then everything else that we didn't write down yet that was in here. So we've used x3 minus x2. The next one up is x4 minus x3. right? So there's plus x4 minus x3 squared and so on. Okay, so let's see if we are smart enough to understand the pattern. We've done two of them already. So what about the nth integral? How does the nth integral look like? So I'm now integrating over dxn, some n in the middle. Could be equal to 723. Right. So what does it look like? So as you see, there's always the same exponent in the beginning. It's e to the i m over 2 h bar delta t. And then there are two terms inside uh, the brackets that you have to integrate over. One of them is 
the nth position minus the initial position. And that is always divided by which position you're at. Right? Like over here, it's 1 third of x3 minus x0. And here it was 1 half of x2 minus x0. And then the next one up is just n minus 1, then the n plus 1 minus xn. So this is plus this is squared, and then it's xn plus 1 minus xn squared. This is the nth integral. You have to solve this capital N times. This is what the nth integral looks like. So here you can complete the squares, blah, 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 do all of the computation. And what you get for the nth term, um, it's actually all detailed in equation number 26. But I'm just going to jump to the end. Because the math is not very complicated. It's long, but it's not complicated. The big difference between long and complicated. And actually, also, this you could basically understand of what's going on. You always get this. This is always the same, the square root, the second part. The first part, you always get n divided by n plus 1. Like here, you got a 2 third, and here you got a 1 half. And then you always get uh, the x. Since you've integrated out xn, you're only left with xn plus 1 and x0. But the difference between them in time is n plus 1 delta t, which is what you're dividing by. Okay, so now let's just plug in n equals capital N, and then multiply i1 times i2 times i3, and so on. Take, take together all of the uh, um, solutions, all of the factors that we had in the beginning. After we put everything together, So what I'm going to do now is kind of continue this expression here, but after I've computed all of the integrals. So the normalization constant remains as it is. And then I have a square root. I already had a 1 half, I already had a 2 thirds. And then I also get a, a 3 quarters, right, from the next one up and so on and so forth. And the final one will be n minus 1 over n. Right, if you use, because the, the sum goes up to, I've erased already, the sum goes up to n minus 1, that's the last one. And then you get this square root, you get it once for each integral, so here I had it twice or squared, and now I had n minus 1 times, so I had the square root n minus 1 times. power n minus 1. I think I'll continue talking because it's raining outside anyway. Talk until 12 o'clock at night so we don't get wet. Any objections? That's what I thought. Uh, and then in the final step in, in the exponent, the only thing we're left with is now the final n, so x capital N minus x0, and it's divided by the, the entire duration, n times delta t. And this thing is squared. There's no integration left. Remember that x0 is what I, uh, so 0 means initial. That's a boundary condition that is known. And the same thing, x capital N, that is the end of time boundary condition. So it's the position in the end. I already erased it. But there used to be a T capital N here. So these two positions are known. That's where I'm releasing the particle and where I put the detector. I know these places. Um, so all we have to do now to finish off is kind of clean up a little bit. We have to plug in the normalization constant. 
Uh, we can cancel the twos and the threes and the fours and so on, and the n minus one, we're left with one over n, right? And then if we look at the normalization constant, which now have to plug in, I'm going to rename this as it was. I'm going to call this now x final and this thing x initial. Uh, and if you look at this n, this actually just had this square root, but capital N times. Right? The, the normalization constant was, do you remember? Let's write it down again. I'll plug in the normalization constant. This thing here is m over 2 pi i h bar delta t to the n over 2. And here it's n minus 1 divided by 2, the square root, right? So you lose all but 1. It's, it's the inverse of this. And the only one that is left, you have this n times this delta t, and n times delta t, that is capital T. It's the entire duration. That's how we get rid of uh, the stuff that we're, not, that we're not allowed to have in the end. So if you go through this little bit of algebra, you find the final propagator. This is the end of this uh, exercise. Two pi i h bar times capital T e to the i m over two h bar t x final minus x initial squared. Solution. Let's make a beautiful frame. So I repeat, what does this mean? If you now want to do an experiment, you release the particle at position xi, and you ask the question, what is the probability that it hits detector at xf after time capital T? All you have to do is plug in all the numbers into here, the mass of the particle, and so on, plug it all in. Absolute value squared, that's the probability. That's what this means. It took a long time to derive it, but you've done it once. Any time you have a free particle, you can use this. This is true for any free particle, not just my free particle, also your free particle. Okay? So I've done it once, it can be used. Questions about this exercise? Yeah, let's do a little bit more interesting exercise. Let's talk about the harmonic oscillator. Seems I'm scaring the IDF with these intervals. Second one already. OK. Um, so uh, the Lagrangian of a harmonic oscillator is kinetic energy minus potential energy. Omega is the eigenfrequency of the harmonic oscillator. And this means that the integral that I have to solve, or the propagator for the harmonic oscillator, is normalization constant functional integral over all possible trajectories, e to the i m over 2 h bar, integral from 0 to capital T, dt, and now we're left with the action of already taken out factors of mass and 2. So all I'm left with here is x dot squared minus omega squared x squared. One way of solving this, it's not a lot of fun, but one way of solving this, not what we're going to do, is to use the exact, schemes, the exact same scheme as with above. So split it up, um, discretize time, and then you have Gaussian integrals because you'll have xn plus 1 and xn minus xn squared here, another x squared here. So they're all Gaussian integrals. And you can use the exact same scheme as we did for a free particle, just with kind of you know, a little more stuff inside. But the exact same thing works. Recognize the pattern, and, and you're done. This can be done. 
Uh, it takes a lot of time. Uh, it is done in the book by Schulman, for example, which I put online if you really want to look at it. Um, but this is not what we're going to do. We're going to use some, some tricks, uh, try to apply some physics on the way to make it a little mathematically simpler and a little bit more interesting. Um, OK, so let's do that. Yeah. Simple question. Where is this T? If we put the temperature. It's not temperature, it's time. I know, but if, for example, if we imagine some system, there's a particle and it is a low temperature and we increase temperature and what is probability that this particle. Okay, so. so the temperature isn't even involved in this theory. This is quantum mechanics 101. There's no temperature in the system. It's a single particle system. How do you find a temperature for a single particle? You can't, right? You need statistical physics for that. You need a, an ensemble of, well, you can argue how many is many, right? You need many particles in order to find a temperature. So, so th this, is, this is not the, what we're doing here, right? Um, but I, don't I, th I think you'll have to ask, I'm not quite sure how to find temperature for a single particle. Uh, I've used kinetic energy. I know kinetic energy is, for ensemble, the, the average kinetic energy is temperature as an ensemble. You want to find just the kinetic energy, but you have kinetic energy, right? You know the kinetic energy. So I don't, I'm not sure how to... Not, not in the way I see directly. OK, so what's the first trick that we want to do? So first of all, we want to decompose the trajectory. So remember, we have to sum over all trajectories, x of t. But I'm not going to decompose them. I'm going to say that the total trajectory that he's taking, so this red trajectory, I'm going to write it as a sum of two trajectories. One of them is the classical trajectory. By classical, I mean the trajectory that satisfies the equation of motion. So xc satisfies that xc double dot equals minus omega squared xc. That's the equation of motion for the harmonic oscillator. I hope you know that. Uh, and xq is everything else. This is absolutely general, right? Because you could say, so what is xq? This is just some random thing. So xq is whatever trajectory the particle actually took minus this specific trajectory. Right, so this x classical, you solve this equation, you get a times cosine plus b times sine. Then you can figure out what a and b are according to your initial conditions, which I remind you, you know them. So everything that is not cosine plus sine is this xq. This is absolutely general. Um, what about boundary conditions? So the boundary conditions apply for the classical trajectory. So x of ti, the total x of ti at the initial time is equal to where the classical particle is at ti. And the same thing goes for the final time. And this means that at this initial time, when I, know, when I know exactly where a particle is, and at the final time, when I also know exactly where a final particle is, it's at its classical point, that means that at these times, the quantum uh, position is 0. You can think of this total the total trajectory as the trajectory you would expect from classical physics plus some quantum fluctuations. But if you know where that particle is because you're releasing it or because you detected it, there are no quantum fluctuations. And that's what this is telling you. So why was this even helpful? It looks cool, but why, why would we do this? So let's write down the uh, Lagrangian. So the total Lagrangian is now one half um, it's x dot squared, but x dot is xc dot plus xq dot, this thing squared. 
and now minus potential energy, which is again xc plus xq squared. I'll open up the square, shift turns around a little bit. What you get is one half m xc dot minus squared minus omega squared xc squared. Right, that's the first part from here and the first part from here. Then I can take the second, uh, the, the last term, x dot q squared and xq squared, that is one half m xq dot squared minus omega squared xq squared. And then I have the cross term from here and the cross term from the potential energy. That's plus m xq dot minus omega squared xc xq. And so what you see, I've now broken it down into three different parts. The first part depends only on the classical trajectory. So I'll call this the classical Lag Lagrangian. The second part depends only on the quantum trajectory. So I call this the quantum Lagrangian. And then there's one term which I don't like very much, and that's the next term. The cool thing about the harmonic oscillator, and this happens only for the harmonic oscillator, is that this term is zero. And let me show you why. I think I'll erase my trajectories. We're doing the same thing now, right? But now we have a harmonic potential on top of this. That's the only difference, at least in theory. So let's look at the action of the mixed part. So it's the integral dt over the mixed part of the Lagrangian. So it is m times the integral dt over this stuff. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to integrate by parts in the first term. I'm going to, I'm going to integrate by parts. I'm going to, I'm going to get xc double dot. I'm going to get a minus sign, minus xc double dot times xq. In a second, we'll talk about the boundary term. And then I have omega squared xc xq. OK, so I integrated xc dot xq dot by parts. By, by parts. One term is minus xc double dot and xq. And there's one term on the outside, which is xc, time, XC dot times xq. Remember? That's the boundary term. But xq, I have to evaluate it between t initial and t final. And there is 0. So the boundary term vanishes due to this boundary condition. I'm left with this. Why is this helpful? Well, we can now take xq outside of the brackets, take the minus sign outside as well. So we have your xc double dot plus omega squared xc times xq. And now you should go, ah. No? Let me uh, highlight. Why you should go, uh huh. Can I hear it? Uh -huh. Right? That's the equation of motion. So this vanishes not, it's not a, uh, an approximation or anything like that. It vanishes because xc, by definition, satisfies the equation of motion. So this mixed term just goes away, and now I have two different problems. One of them is a classical problem, and one's a quantum problem. Total separation of classical and quantum physics. Yes. Right, because both x dot and x are squared. Right, that's the trajectory. Right, so, so why? But the Lagrangian can, the, this is what the Lagrangian looks like, right? Yeah. So you obviously get terms that are mixed. So the Lagrangian yeah, is, yeah, is I, kind I of. I understand this mathematically, but I mean physically. Was it mean physically? Well, let's say that it was not this case and the mixed action would not cancel. Um, so it means that your action has a contribution, right, from, from the classical trajectory. 
which is obvious. It has a contribution from the quantum particles, but there's some, uh, I, don't, I don't have an intuitive answer for you. I, I'm not quite sure what to say about this. Just, yeah, but it's cool that it yeah, goes away, right? I, I just don't understand the, the, part, the mixed part, what it means, like what, what it becomes. It's, it's kind of hard to interpret a Lagrangian in general, right? So the only thing we can do with Lagrangian is, well, we can find the equations of motion from it. Yeah, but I think I'm not quite sure what to say. It's a good question. Um, I'm not quite sure what intuition you can get from here. Um, and think about it. Okay, so what are we left with? We're left with a classical action and a, and a quantum action. So now, uh, what happens to the propagator? Let's go back to our propagator, which is up here. So instead of having the integral over e to the i over h bar times s, it is now integral over. There's one more thing I have to tell you here. Um, so it's the integral over dx e to the i over h bar classical plus i over h bar s quantum, where s classical and s quantum are the integral dt of the, the respective Lagrangian. Now, the one thing that you still have to do is, uh, since we changed the, um, the trajectory, so basically it's kind of like, this is kind of like shifting the trajectory. The classical trajectory is kind of like constant. No matter what trajectory a particle actually takes, the classical part is always the same. What differs from, for different trajectories is the quantum fluctuations. So this is like shifting by a, by a constant, just in functional terms. So the actual integral is only over xq. So when you do this change of variables, what happens to your uh, differential is that this dx becomes a dxq. So it's just shifting by a constant, x plus c, right? y equals x, x plus c, so dy is dx. The c doesn't matter. And this is kind of like your, your constant, because no matter what trajectory you take, it's always the same trajectory. Make sense? And since you only have to integrate over the quantum part, and the quantum trajectories only appear in SQ, but not in SC, you can now take this outside. So it's e to the i over h bar SC, integral dxq e to the um, i over h bar xq. Uh, let me just write down again that the argument is going to be important. And so what we have to do here now is, is two things. First of all, we have to evaluate the action of the classical trajectory. That is easy. We will do it in a few minutes. We'll keep it to the end because it's the easy part. And we have to evaluate this integral. And this is a little bit more complicated, but we'll do it in a second. One thing I just want to point out. Notice that this integral, if you just, I mean, the Q is just notation, right? You might as well write integral dx e to the i over h bar s. So this is just a propagator in its own right. And I'm missing a normalization constant somewhere. This thing here is a, uh, a propagator in its own right, but it's a special kind of propagator. It is also the harmonic oscillator propagator because the Lagrangian is precisely the harmonic oscillator Lagrangian. It's not some other Lagrangian, so it's still a harmonic oscillator, meaning that this is the same k as here, but now the initial conditions are the quantum initial conditions. So this is the propagator for releasing a particle at x equals zero and detecting it at x equals zero sometime capital T later. So this is the same propagator, but with the argument zero, zero, capital T. What I'm trying to tell you here is that uh, the propagator for a harmonic oscillator uh, for any random initial and final conditions is equal to releasing and capturing it at the minimum, or x equals zero, where the potential energy vanishes, vanishes, times a phase, which is just the classical uh, action. 
Again, I don't have intuition for this, but it's just a cool thing to note. Okay, so let's, uh, let's talk about the elephant in the room. Let's try and solve this integral. Until now, I've been doing uh, some, some cool manipulations, but we haven't really solved anything yet. So maybe we should start. So what I want to solve now is this K00T, which is equal to normalization constant times functional over integ integral over all quantum trajectories xq. And each trajectory contributes a phase factor. Like so. OK, so we like encoding by parts, right? Let's do this again. We can, uh, specifically, we can integrate. So what is x q dot squared? It's x dot times x dot. So we can integrate by part and get x double dot times x with a minus sign. Right? And then the boundary term vanishes again because of these boundary conditions. So I can write this integral up here as minus the integral dt xq times xq double dot plus omega squared xq. So I've integrated by parts. Instead of x dot x dot, I get x with no dot times x double dot. And then I can take the xq out of the parentheses and also take down an order here. Nothing special. Now let's define the operator O, which is equal to minus m over h bar ddt squared plus omega squared. And with this operator, I can now rewrite k00t in the following way. Normalization constant, integral dxq, e to the i over 2, integral from 0 to t, dt, xq, o, xq. You got it? I took everything that we didn't like and I put it inside O. That was neat, right? Now it's gone. So let me show you why this is actually simple. And this, by the way, when I mentioned question number one in homework number, in this week's homework, it's about these kind of integrals and how to solve them. And as you'll see next week in field integration, this is going to be very important. Instead of x, we're then going to have phi. So a coherent state, a coherent uh, state that is associated with a certain field. But for now, it's just this operator. We know what it looks like. Uh, and the trick to solve such an integral, um, you're going to discover it slightly easier in the homework. But let me just show you the actual physics uh, behind it. And maybe that will also help you to understand what's going on. Um, so the idea is that we want to um, diagonalize this operator, um, and then it'll be much easier to solve. So let's assume that we have, uh, that we know the eigenstates, actually we know the eigenstates are quite easy, uh, of this operator. So we're going to call, call them phi n. These are functions of time, right, because O is a derivative in time, so the eigenfunctions are functions of time. It is equal to some lambda n phi n of t. That's just uh, eigenvalue equation, um, and the eigenfunctions are orthogonal, so phi n phi m is equal to delta n m. It is quite easy to figure out that these phi n of t are square root 2 over t sine n pi over capital T times t. 
if this reminds you of an infinite potential well, then, well, it should. Uh, but the eigenvalues, lambda n, um, are m over n h bar n pi over t squared minus omega squared. If you don't believe me, plug this in, do this operation, you'll see it works. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, there's xc double dot. Right. So I took this and I integrated by parts. Oh. You integrate this by parts, you get a double dot and a no dot. Yep. And the boundary term we say cancels because of the boundary conditions on xq. Okay, so I have these, these are the uh, eigenstates and, and, and eigenenergies or eigenfunction, eigenvalues of uh, uh, this operator O. Uh, and if you know your uh, eigenstates, which um, span a basis, you can take your trajectories xq of t, and you can expand them in a series of these eigenstates, right? Just decomposing it onto your base vectors. So what happens to this integral up here? So the integral over dt xq o xq. I'm not going to plug this in twice for the first xq and for the second xq. I'm going to use two different summation indices, so I get confused, n and m. So I get sum over m and sum over n integral dt a n phi n O A M phi M. Now this is simple because what I have to do now is act with O to the right. On to, so A M is just a number, right? That comes to the beginning. Same goes for A M. And when O acts on phi M, what do I get? By definition, I get its eigenvalue. So this is sum over M and N. A N A M, and then I get a lambda M, and I'm left with an integral over phi N and phi M. That's also simple, that's a delta function, again by definition. So this is the sum over N, A N squared times lambda N. So all of this messy, this messy thing appearing in the exponent, when I try to hide the complicated stuff in O, it was actually a good idea because now it's just a n. And when I did this, um, when, when I did this expansion of x q into the phi n's, now I again have to change my integration constant or my integration uh, variable. It is no longer x q, but it is. Don't say phi, because well, it's not phi, it's a, right? Phi are a set of defined functions. What the difference between different xq are its different coefficients. So instead of summing over all of the possible values xq, I need to integrate over all of the possible combinations of a n. So the propagator is now Um, normalization constant. I'm integrating over all different a n. Right, there are an infinite number of a n's in here, for n goes from one to infinity. Uh, so I need to integrate over all of them, e to the i over two, sum over n, lambda n a n squared. But look, it's a Gaussian integral. Easy. In case you don't see it yet, let me write it out for you. So if you can't make sense of pi's and sigmas, just write them out, right? So it's an integral over all dA, so it's dA1, dA2, 
and so on, d a n minus 1. And then a sum in the exponent is a product of exponents, right? So this is times e to the i over 2 lambda 1 a 1 squared, e to the i over 2 lambda 2 a 2 squared, and so on. So you can now shift around, right? The a1 only appears as an integration variable and only appears in the first exponent. a2 only appears in the second, right, and the second. So it's just a product of a minus 1 uh, Gaussian integrals. So you can solve one of them and take the power, but not exactly the power, because they have different, different lambda. So you have to take, you know what I mean, just multiply them by each other. Uh, so let's, let's do that. So when you solve all of these integrals, normalization constant, and then you get 2 pi over i lambda 1, and then 2 pi i over lambda 2, and so on, 2 pi i over lambda n minus 1, which you could technically write this as, so let's take all of the 2 pi i's and put them inside n, and we'll worry about that later. Uh, so you just write this as some new normalization constant product from n minus 1, from n equals 1 to capital N minus 1 over all lambda n's to the power of minus 1 half. Uh, an interesting thing to note, by the way, and this might something you might uh, recognize also in, in this in this said homework question. What is the product of all the eigenvalues? What do you call that? So you have an operator. You take all its eigenvalues and you multiply them. What do you get? Right. Determinant. Determinant. This is just the determinant of O. The trace is the sum of all the diagonal values. Uh, and, and determinant, well, if it's diagonal, it's easy, right? Because you just, just multiply over them. Who's the determinant of O? So if you have an integral over some operator, what I'm, what I'm trying to tell you here, and this is something that I said that you'll explore in depth uh, in, in the homework, when you have a Gaussian integral with some operator, you get something that is proportional to 1 over square root of the determinant of that operator. So you don't have to actually do this expansion every single time, you just find the determinant of your operator. That might not be that easy, but at least tell you something about it, about what's going on. Ooh, eight minutes. Okay, we're getting there. So um, there's an uh, interesting parameter in our uh, problem that is the frequency omega. Right, omega tells you how strongly you can find the particle is. It's the, the eigenfrequency. It's, you can think of it as the, as the spring constant. Um, so what happens if I plug in omega equals zero? What's a harmonic oscillator with eigenfrequency equals zero, meaning that the the time it takes to go back and forth is 1 divided by 0 is infinite. What do I get? What happens if you take the Lagrangian and plug in omega equals 0? The free particle, right? You take the potential energy, which is omega squared and something, you plug in omega equals 0, there's no potential. An harmonic oscillator with omega equals 0 is a free particle. So let's see if we can use that to our um, advantage. So let's take this uh, k that we just found, and uh, let me write down once more. And I'm now going to write down k omega to um, write explicitly that it's a function of this parameter omega. And we just found that it is equal to 
some normalization constant, which we don't know at the moment, because we absorbed all sorts of stuff into it. Um, so it's some n times the product to the minus 1 half. In particular, if I plug in omega equals 0, And this is equal to the normalization constant. And also let me write here lambda n of omega, because lambda n is a function here of omega, right? That's what changes when I change the, uh, the confinement of the particle. So this is the product n minus 1, n equals 1 to n minus 1 lambda n of 0 to the minus 1 half. But this thing must be equal to the propagator of a free particle that leaves xi equals 0 and is detected at x finally equals 0 time t later. So this is equal to k free 0, 0 t. And we evaluated k free about 30 minutes ago. So let's plug in x1, x2 equals 0. Basically what happens is what we had there is exponent of x, x final minus x initial squared. So the exponent just gives 1. And we're only left with whatever was left. That's 2 pi i h bar capital T. So here I used what we derived half an hour ago. OK, so far so good. Let's look at the ratio. So let's take this k omega and divide it by k0. So this is just equal to um, so n goes away, and you're left with this divided by this, um, which is just the product of lambda n of 0 divided by lambda n of omega to the power of 1 half. So here at minus 1 half, you have 1 half. That's why it's the other way around. I'm, summing, I'm taking the product over all n's. And uh, this product is equal to, so let's leave this square root outside. It's the product, so lambda n with omega equals 0 is n pi over t squared divided by n pi over t squared minus omega squared. In other words, this is, sorry, it's multiplied. This is pi n um, 1 minus 1 omega t over n pi squared. And now at this stage, you scratch your head for a little. Um, then you realize that you might as well take capital N to infinity. So now you're taking the product over all n's from 1 to infinity. And then you scratch your head a little longer. Uh, and then you open up a computer and you put this in, uh, and what you get, uh, what the computer spits out, uh, I'm sorry, I really don't know how to do this by hand, but what the computer spits out when you plug this in is omega t over sine uh, omega t. It's, it's not a sum, it's a product. If it were a sum, I could solve it. I would be a Taylor sum, I would know what to do. But it's not a sum, it's a product. So um, for some reason, this is what happens when you put into the into Mathematica. Try it. I really don't know why this happens. And I'm, I'm totally puzzled. But it works. Actually, it doesn't work if omega t equals pi. Because if omega t is equal to pi, then it kind of diverges. Well, for n, equal, the n equals 1 term diverges. And then you're lost. So this only works if omega t is different from pi. Which means you have to choose your detection time such that it's not a multiple of Right, uh, of the frequency. In any case, what, what can we do with this? So now we've evaluated this. Yeah. Right? And now basically done, right? Because now we know that uh, k0 is equal to this thing. The ratio of k omega and k0 is equal to the square root of this thing. That means that we now know k, k omega. Right? It's, 
k0 times the ratio. So we find k omega 0, 0, t, uh, and it is equal to square root of m omega over 2 pi i h bar sine omega t. Uh, so let's just look back at our propagator. Remember, our propagator was uh, the total propagator. So going from x initial to x final in time t, well, that was equal to the classical phase, e over i h bar classical uh, action, times the same one with 0, 0, t. So that's just this square root here. So we've now done the difficult part. We've evaluated this quantum integral. The only thing we now have to do is find the classical action. And I have like 30 seconds to do that. So also for the classical action, there are two ways of finding it. Uh, a complicated way, which works, but it's mathematically more demanding. And also here, but also here there is a trick that you can use. So I'm going to do the, the trick thingy. Let me first show you the, 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 the stubborn way to do it, the, 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 the way it always works. Tricks always, harmonic oscillator always has tricks, right, because both x dot and x are, are quadratic. So there are always tricks that you can do. That's why we, physicists love harmonic oscillators. It's the most complicated thing we can solve, basically. So what is a classical? It is m over 2, integral 0 t, uh, dt x dot c squared minus omega squared x c squared. Um, and so one way of solving this is the following. You take the classical solution of the equation of motion which is a times sine plus b times cosine, you find a and b for your initial conditions. Uh, and well, all we know about our initial conditions is that x at ti is equal to some xi, and x at t final is equal to some x final. So these are quite complicated boundary conditions, such as 0 and you know, x equals 0 and x dot equals 1, and then makes it easy. So the solutions look complicated, but it's just, they only look complicated. They're, they're, is the, the most general case when xi is not zero. You're used to seeing xi equals zero in, in most of your uh, courses. So it's some constant times sine plus some constant times cosine. And the some constant looks a little complicated. And you can then look at xc dot which is the derivative of this thing. So it's x final minus xi cosine omega t over sine omega t. Sorry, this is capital T. Times omega times cosine omega t, right? Because I take the derivative, I get out an omega. Minus xi omega sine omega t. So the, the stopping way of doing this is take this xc, plug it into here. Take the square of this thing, enjoy. Take this x dot, put it in here. Take the square again. And then you have an integral dt where you have functions of t. So you're solving functions over sine squared and sine times cosine and stuff like that. right? And this is not a full, um, you can use tricks. Because this t has nothing to do with omega. It's not the period. So you cannot just say sine times cosine is equal to 0. That doesn't work. So this works, this, this way of plugging in works, but it takes um, a long time. Uh, and the trick is, as always, integrate by parts. And if you integrate by parts, you have to be careful. Now the boundary terms do not vanish because we have non-zero boundary conditions. So we have to write down the boundary term. That's like the tricky part. You cannot throw away the boundary term. It's like so unexpected, right? But you, so you need to keep the boundary term, xc times xc dot 0t. 
minus m over 2, integral from 0 to t, um, dt, xc double dot, xc plus omega squared xc. Take a look, xc squared, sorry. Take a look at the integrand, what happens? Uh -huh. Why does it vanish? Come on. Let's take this xc and put it here. Yeah. What is this? Zero. It's the equation of motion, right? Yeah. So what did I do? Instead of plugging this stuff in and doing a million integrals, I just integrate by parts and then the integral just vanishes. Yeah. One thing have, the only thing you have to do now is plug in xc and xc dot from here. I have to plug it in twice. Once I plug them in with little t equals capital T, and then minus the same thing again, little t equals zero. Right? That's much easier than doing the integrals. Uh, and when you do this, a little bit of mathematics, but it's much simpler algebra, what you get is m omega over 2, xi squared plus x final squared, cosine omega t over sine, omega t minus 2 xi x final over sine omega t. And now we're done. Let's just write down our final solution in full beauty. We should appreciate our hard work. So we have the normalization constant that we already found earlier on, m omega over 2 pi i h bar sine omega t. Um, and then we have e to the i over h bar with the classical action. So that's this thing again. Because I could write a tangent instead of, or one over tangent instead of this. It doesn't really matter. 2x i x final over sine omega t. So once again, what is this propagator? You have a particle inside a, um, a harmonic, inside a harmonic potential, release it at some position xi, you put a detector at position xf, you write a certain time t, what is the probability to find it? Just plug in the numbers, absolute value squared, you're done. Uh, it actually turns out that you can use this specific, uh, there are a few applications for this. So this is the K of harmonic oscillator. Uh, one of the things that you can do with this, which is homework question number two, you can actually find uh, the spectrum of the harmonic oscillator. So h bar omega uh, plus one half, sorry, h bar omega n plus one half, uh, you can actually find it from here. You do some, some manipulations that I've instructed how to do it in, in question number two. So one of the things you're going to do, actually the only thing you're going to do with path integral in the homework is do this. Uh, all the other questions were taken out because you'll have one week, so, well, sucks, it's but fun. never mind. It is what it is. Questions? Okay, so for you, sorry for the overtime, but I'll see you next week. We're gonna apply this to fields.